Huang Wen. I am a laser scientist working at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, living in Livermore, California. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Um, not in a million years did I ever think that I would grow up to be a scientist, but let alone a a, a laser scientist. Uh, I'm <laughs> I'm curious, how do you arrive? How did you arrive in your life? to go one day, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next uh, three, four decades of your life. <laughs> yeah, it's actually an interesting story. And I don't know. I am like a lot of my friends that kind of dreamt about being scientists or working with lasers ever since they were young. That that wasn't my story at all. And I just kind of fell into this occupation. And so, you know, we grew up in a very fairly blue collar community. And it was pretty clear and evident to our family at a very young age that, you know, we're going to, if we wanted to go to college, which was you know, a big deal. And so, as you know, you know, going, higher education, going to college is a big thing. Uh, but actually paying for it was never at, you know, discussed. <laughs> and so uh, I did fairly well in high school grade wise and was able to lucky enough to get uh, a scholarship at a local college called Oregon Technology, Oregon Institute of Technology. And uh, it was, I think, their presidential scholarship, which gave me tuition, books, supplies, and even room and board. Um, and so it was pretty clear that I was going to go to Oregon Tech. <laughs> um, and I really didn't know what I wanted to do in Oregon Tech is, you know, one of the central schools uh, in the Oregon educational system that focused on, you know, engineering, engineering technology, uh, and those sort of um, um, majors. And so when I met with the counselor and the person goes, you know, what, do you, what are you interested in? I said, no, I don't really know. Uh, I really like business. I really like chemistry. And they go, well, we don't have either one of those subjects here. <laughs> and just looking at, you know, your math grades and, and you know, and things and I think they probably also thinking you're Asian, right? You're pretty good at math. You know, we have this new curriculum that is, you know, up and coming. It's super difficult, but you know, I think it's it's right up your alley and it's and it's lasers. Lasers up. And the professor came from a very prestigious uh, university to start this program, um, from the Optical Science Center in Arizona to start this program here in Oregon at Oregon Tech. And so that's how I fell into that. And it wasn't until I guess it was my junior year. Uh, I just kind of flailed around, took the classes. It was actually a really hard major, really, really tough. I think we started with you know, a couple of hundred students my freshman year. I mean, it was an auditorium. And we graduated seven in my class. Wow. And of the seven, I think there was only five of us from the original group. And the other two were from a prior class. Um, so it was pretty demanding. Um, but I, you know, I just was never really into this subject until, uh, until my summer, my junior year, I applied for an internship at Lawrence Livermore where I'm working now. And, uh, this physicist offered me a job to come and work for him in the summer to build lasers from materials that he actually developed, you know, him and his group developed here. Um, and so I, Came down here and worked for as an internship and really, you know, started to see, you know, some of the amazing and fun, exciting work that was being done in this field and, and uh, you know, opened my eyes to, to this whole new world. Um, and the work that I did with this physicist turned out to be, you know, uh, pretty phenomenal. And so he wanted me to stay, and I, at the time, needed a senior thesis as well. And so I asked him, you know, I said, can I just do this work for my senior thesis? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So I ended up staying and working, you know, for the next year, off and on, on weekends, through holidays and stuff, coming down here between school and, you know, doing uh, this laser building up Kind of a, a new laser material uh, in a laser system um, as my thesis. And then from there, he linked me up with another physicist that was starting uh, uh, a new technology here at Lawrence Livermore. 
and I hired on with him after I graduated. So, and yeah, that, that was the late eighties. This was uh, early nineties. So it was ninety two. Ninety two. Yeah, because I, I just imagine the landscape of of war and you know technology um, in the early nineties, late eighties. Uh, I'm not thinking of of a whole lot of you know missile systems or anything guided by lasers yet. Is it? Um, uh, back then, probably not. Um, you know, I think op, you know, lasers and optics are optics are kind of synonymous with each other in terms of technology. And so, you know, lasers have been around for you know uh, quite a few decades, but actually, you know, using lasers has been more kind of like commercial industrial type of. Um, uh, of applications, right? We've been using lasers like to read CD players, for instance, for, you know, for a very, very long time. Lasers for, you know, measurements for construction and, um, you know, roads, uh, for, um, surveying has been around for a long time. Um, you know, we know laser pointers have been for a long time. So these are, you know, lower power kind of devices and, and, and systems. Uh, but now, you know, you're seeing lasers uh, more ubiquitous in sort of high-powered applications like machining, by like cutting up steel, you know, uh, in automotive industry, you know, in the manufacturing industry. So you're starting to see kind of lasers everywhere. Yeah. Sorry about that. Now, when um, I, yeah, I think about uh, these different institutions in America, uh, all over the country, and even all over the world, you could say there's things that we don't know about. Livermore Labs is a thing that very few of us know about. And I know of, quote unquote, the lab from you, but I looked into the Livermore Labs and I didn't realize like it's an actual real, I mean, I don't use, I use the word institution with a capital I. Uh, yeah. It's a, a real uh, prestigious place and i just i'm learning that uh as i've researched about about where you work can you tell me a little bit about the history of that lab yeah I'm, i feel extremely fortunate to uh be working here and this is actually my second stint at the lab and so i started as i mentioned right out of college and uh, i actually left for a number of years and went down and worked you know in the industry private industry uh in silicon valley and then came back to the lab um but the lab's been around, uh, you know, since, you know, the times of World War II. Um, and you've seen some of this, a little bit of, you know, discussions about the lab, uh, you know, in the movie Oppenheimer. Um, and so some of that work uh, with the atomic bomb was done here at the lab. Um, so the lab has a, a history and, you know, with involvement uh, and still is heavily involved with uh, the country's nuclear arsenal. And so... Uh, a good portion of the lab and still works in that area where you know one of the major uh, missions of the lab is to maintain uh, and verify and help make sure that the current arsenal of nuclear weapons are is going to function properly. But on top of that, you know, uh, the lab's also researching and developing a potential, you know, new designs and uh, of nuclear weapons here. Uh, so that's ongoing. Uh, but also the lab now has proliferated into almost every other area of science, uh, you know, from supercomputing here uh, at the lab to biology to material science um, to lasers and optics, uh, to the environment. Um, and so we dabble, you know, in, in almost every area. And uh, I'm a little bit, um, uh, uh, I guess, embarrassed to say that I, I actually know, you know, a very small portion what the lab does. It's, it's amazing to me as I wander around and go to different meetings and you know, and, and visit different groups, all the things that, you know, that the lab actually has its fingers on. It's, it's super impressive. Uh, and it's a really unique place. Um, one of the things I, I learned 
you know, when I went to private industry is, is, you know, what we do at the lab is very different than what's done in private industry. And you actually need a place like a national lab where you're not, you know, where your, your objective is not to make, you know, a widget or make hardware to make money, right? When, when you're driven by a business objective, um, it, it's different than, and then advancing and developing technologies. And, you know, one of the big things that national labs do is they, you know, they work on technologies that private industry can't afford to, or doesn't make biz- good business sense, right? And then what we do is we turn around and, and, and give that back to industry. So most of the technologies that I work on is readily available to, to U.S. industry. Uh, and, you know, our group and, and, and my program and all really all of the lab has a very rich history of, of transferring technology out to industry. It's one of you know it, it's one of the things that we, that we do focus on and pride ourselves on is is doing that. Um, and and when it goes from your lab to private industry, are there does private industry have to pay for the rights to use the technology, or is it given as an incentive? to kind of uh, grow the economy here in America? Yeah, there's, there's different, um, uh, there's different um, avenues for that approach to that. Um, you know, you as a private industry can come to the lab and actually hire, hire, you know, a team here at the lab to develop a technology for you. And those are called cooperative research agreements, creatives. It's, you know, uh, or you can take something that's already been developed that is been publicly released and available and license that. And so there are licenses and royalties that um, the lab, uh, you know, sets uh, for these technologies, but they're, they're very minimal. They're not, you know, there's, it's, 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 you know, it's very inexpensive to license technology from lab and very easy to license technology from the lab. Uh, now, does that mean that other countries uh, can go in and just purchase that, that technology as well, or is it kind of only limited to American uh, business? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm not very familiar with that side. Um, I had not seen, you know, at least the work that we've done and have made available to the public for licensing being licensed uh, outside of the U S uh, uh, I'm sure that if you are you know, an ally of the U S um, then that technology could be made available. Uh, some of it is what they're considered as export controlled, and mm-hmm. that and that sort of technology would not be available. Yeah, um, and it's you know sort of on a specific um, technology basis. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. It's like a export control. What a wonderful way. <laughs> <to put> it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. So I, I uh, you know, I, I, you know, this podcast, I mean, you've known me for a long time now, and I, this podcast is not meant to like go into any weird attack mode, but I do have a question about okay. the ethics of a scientist like yourself when yeah. you are developing these systems that you know is uh, capable of, of, you know, taking out, uh, you know, life. Um, yeah. Do you ever have to compliment, uh, contemplate those sort of questions no absolutely i think if you're at all a good person you have to think about these things right you have to uh, or i don't know if you have to but you should <laughs> think about these things yeah. right um so for me i am a strong believer in deterrent you know big big strong believer in deterrent and it's unfortunate that you know that nuclear weapons exist but they do. And I'm glad that we have them and control them. Uh, but it's one of those Pandora's box. You know, I know it's a cliche, but it really is. And you know, it's it, and you know, if you watched any, you know, and seen any of the discussions on a new a potential nuclear war, there's no winners, right? I mean, everybody's a loser. Um, but there, you know, we live in a world and have lived in the world where ideology is, you know, very dominant. It, 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 
um, and present. And there are lots of people in this world, even though they're a super small percentage, right, that uh, can wreak, you know, amazing amount of havoc on the rest of us, um, you know, with just a simple decision. And, you know, I'm a b big believer that uh, you know, us having nuclear weapons, you know, provides us with the safety, this deterrent from others attacking. I, you know, I, I always talk and think about, you know, if Ukraine, right, Ukraine, when they became their own country, had to give up their nuclear weapons. Right? And we're seeing kind of the hardships and what's going on between, you know, the Ukraine war and what Russia is doing, you know, to Ukrainian people, you know, because of, you know, this ideology. And would Russia have to attack Ukraine if they had nuclear weapons? You know, um, I don't think they would have. I, you know, so my belief is, is, is that it probably wouldn't have happened. And potentially Ukraine and, you know, its people would not be in the position that they, they are now. And, and really not just Ukraine, but, really, you know, all of, all of Western society, you know, all of Europe, right? Um, I mean, you know, everybody that borders Russia, you know, all the countries that border Russia are extremely fearful. Right? Um, and so for those countries that don't have nuclear weapons, uh, you know, Thank goodness there's NATO and that they're, you know, and that you know, they can band together, the allies, the European, Western countries can band together, you know, to put up, you know, this, you know, this stiff front uh, towards Russia. But, um, yeah, um, I, you know, and I think lasers in, so lasers in, used as, uh, you know, a war type of device uh, systems. Yeah, you're going to see it, unfortunately. You know, so the laser weapon systems that uh, you know we've been uh, helping develop and that uh, that you're starting to hear a lot about in the public domain. You know, is is meant to be a defensive system, but you know, uh, just like with you know anything that's defensive. You know, it can always have you know, an offensive use too, yeah. you know, as well, right? Um, so yeah, no doubt that that you'll see that. Um, uh, yeah, so it's it's hard to think about that. Um, but the other thing that gives me kind of like souls is that you know I'm also a big believer in giving our war fighters the best technology that that we possibly can to help ensure that they get home to their families, you know, that these, you know, young women and men, older women and men, you know, um, you know, uh, have a huge sacrifice, right? I mean, to, you know, stand on the wall, as you'd say, sit on the wall and provide this protection for us and, and, you know, whatever I can do or help with, uh, you bring them home to their families is a big deal. Uh, and so, you know, if I, I hope I am contributing in that way. Um, and that, uh, you know, that uh, is something that gives me, you know, comfort. Yeah. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the uh, mechanical side of lasers and, you know, the, the industry of lasers and your awards and <laughs> all the good stuff, <laughs> I want to ask a wacky question. Yeah. The wacky question is when you've traveled, because I know you've traveled uh, quite a bit around the world and you see certain sort of cuts in stones or you see certain things. Do you ever go like, was there a civilization here before that had oh. <laughs> lasers? You ever think about that? Um, not in laser so much, but I think I, I do wonder, you know, you see, you know, you hear you know, there's these documentaries and, and shows that talk about, you know, ancient civilization here before us, right? And yeah, you, you know, some of the stuff that's done is just absolutely amazing. And, and you think about, you know, all the tools that, you know, that, that we utilize, you know, to craft something, to move something, right? To make something. 
And how was this done so primitively back, you know, yeah. you know, hundreds of years ago? Yeah, it's I, I, you know, I don't discount that there could have been, you know, you know, when you look up in the sky, you know, it's it's a big, you know, you know, big unknown, right? And and how can we be potentially the only, you know, living beings or human beings, you know, you know, in this universe? It's you know. It's, they just you can look up there and it's full of stars, you know, which means it's full of planets and galaxies. And, uh, yeah, it's just hard to fathom that. Yeah, uh, there, that there's some, we're the uh, only ones. Yeah, there's some temples in Angkor Wat or all around the world where there's like cuts where you're just like, this is uh, impossible for even like modern day. Like, there, there's cuts behind crevices yeah. where you can't see, or but you could feel your way, you could put your hand in it. And it's smooth and it's cut, but you're like, how did they do that when it's just one piece of rock? It's perfectly cut. <laughs> perfectly cut. Yeah. And yeah. Those... I... Yeah, I agree. It's. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answers to that, but uh, it, it is an interesting question. Huh? It's fun to think about. Yeah. 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 And I, I, you know, because you've, you've been around and was wondering if that. You ever come across stuff that uh, that you're like, wait, this is uh, the technology that we have, but how did they do this in the ancient times? You know, and that yeah. always interesting. Yeah, I'm kind of the other way around. You know, when I go to places and look at things that are being manufactured or made, and they're not using a laser, I'm, I'm always thinking, why don't aren't you using a laser? <laughs> <laughs> and so I think you know everything can be done with a laser, or you know. So. I'm kind of the opposite, I guess, in, in that sense. Yeah. You've explained lasers to me uh, one time um, at a dinner, and I wanted to, you know, get it on the record and, and share with our audience. How do lasers work, and why are yeah. some lasers able to cut through surfaces? Yeah. So lasers, right? So lasers is actually an acronym, right? So L A S E R. So it stands for light amplified stimulated emission radiation. Okay. Um, so that kind of explains what happens or what a laser is. So laser basically is made up of light, right? So light from our screen, light from the bulbs above us, light from the sun, right? The difference is those light, that type of light is what's known as incoherent light. Uh, and incoherent means that the, each individual light beam, you can think of it as a light beam or uh, a photon, is not traveling uh, in sync with each other. Okay. And so each one has its own direction, its own angles. And so it, you know, that's. And that's why you kind of see this more fluorescence, this flood of light. A laser beam, you know, as most people see, like your laser pointer, actually is very direction, right? It's just, it starts out very small and it can grow big, but it can also be small and stay small, but it's very directional. And what happens, the difference is these, you know, beams of light or photons of light are actually what's known as coherent or they're in phase with each other. So they're traveling in the same direction uh, and they can add together uh, to make, you know, a stronger uh, uh, output of light. Okay. And so the way that happens, the way that lasers in the simplest form is made is you have some material uh, that you can excite and, right, and generate photons of light. So a little, photons of light and so light uh the photons of light you're seeing illuminate my skull what you want to do is now put those into what they call uh, a resonator or a cavity where you can get them to travel together and so the simplest lit the simplest of laser is basically a laser gamium that you can excite to generate your emission of light and then you trap them between two mirror so that they bounce back and forth and start to uh, sync up with each other or start to you know be coherent um, and then you let a little bit of that leakage 
out of this trapped, you know, area. Um, so think of it as like a, a, like a tube with two, you know, two mirrors. And so light just kind of rattles back and forth there. And then the tube has a little hole in it or partially, you know, a film that allows a partial reflection out of that. And that's how a laser is actually produced. Um, so that it's this amplified, you know, emission that occurs. So every time the light passes through this gain medium, it gets a little bit stronger and builds up. And the many, the more times it passes through that, the higher the output powers can be. Um, and then, like I mentioned, every pass a little bit leaks out of, of this, you know, this, uh, this entrapped area. Uh, How was this figured out? <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, as I've gotten older, one of the things that is the most important to me in, 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 when it comes to work is finding is really not what I do, but who I work for. Right. And, uh, so I, I see myself as a person that is very effective at executing a plan. Uh, you know, from A to B, I see A to B, you know, really, really well. And I can get to E to be fast and efficient, but I've never been a visionary, you know. Um, and so I always look for the visionary folks to go work for. And it's because these are the people that figure these crazy things out, right? If you look at, you know, I mean, you know, from Galileo, you know, we, you know, to Einstein, you know, to, you know, I mean, these remarkable individuals that I, I think it's hard for us to comprehend what these, you know, to be on the same sort of plane as these, these folks, right? Um, like, I mean, look at Elon Musk, right? A person that can go from PayPal to building, you know, electric cars, really making, you know, bringing like the, you know, bringing like the cards to the forefront to building spaceships, right? Um, reusable rockets that can that can land itself, right? Booster rockets that will land itself. Where NASA spent, you know, decades and you know never got to reusable rockets, right? Um, these individuals, I, I think, are uh, are absolutely just incredible, um, and and these are the folks that think about and come up with these things that. That you know we we don't you know that that uh, we just can't uh, you know imagine and so um, for me it's you know I'm I'm not one of those people I'm more of um, you know a practical applied uh, person and like I said I'm I'm great at executing making things work. Yeah, I, I the more you explain it, the more lost I find myself getting <laughs> you, you know because how do you go from like things that are escaping light particles or whatever that are escaping a tube and what makes it regroup to come out so sharp and powerful right and it's just yeah it sounds like a random escape but how are these random escapees like getting together and coming out so yeah so so good way to think about it a good way to think about it is you know we i think we're all familiar with the uh, of using a magnifying glass to mm -hmm. burn wood or paper or something, right? So here you're taking a magnifying glass, which is, you know, an optic that focuses light, right? Um, and you're collecting light from the sun, which is incoherent, right? So the sunlight, when I talk about incoherent, that means yeah. that, right, that it gives you kind of this broad area and what you do is is you're taking a magnifying glass and focusing it to a really tight spot, right? So tight that you can burn wood or paper with it. And the bigger, if you watch some of these YouTubes, some of these folks like use these gigantic lenses. And so they're using a little, you know, a couple inch magnifying glasses. They use gigantic lenses that are several feet in diameter. And there you're collecting, you know, more light, you know, proportionally to that size of the optic. And you can boil water, you can melt steel with this, right? 
So laser is just really an extension of that, essentially. But the difference is instead of using light that can't, that is, um, in, you know, that's incoherent or not in phase with each other, um, you're using you know, laser uses light that is coherent and in phase. Um, and so there's a terminology called superposition. And, and so if you take like a sine wave, right, or a sine wave, and if the sine waves are off shift where you have a peak uh, and a valley that are directly opposite from each other, they cancel, right? Does that make sense? Yep. And then if they're right on top of each other, they actually add, right? And so laser is like that too. So when I talk about coherent light, it's like that, think about it in a sine wave where those peaks and valleys are perfectly lined up with each other. So they add together, um, you know, where in co incoherent light, that sinusoidal pattern of each, uh, you know, uh, of each particle can be all in different places. Uh, so that's what keeps them from, you know, really being additively or growing in power is because there's no, you know, because they're not locked to each other. Um, and does yeah. the same so, mechanics apply when you crank up the laser for more strength? Yeah. So building lasers for higher power is, you know, um, is, is really adding in more either what you have to use basically produce more gain. Oh, you know, it's a, a good analogy. is like using a car steering, right? So car stereo, you start with some really small signal that you um, generate from either a, in the old days from a CD or it's probably easier to talk about a CD or a signal that you pull out of the air from radio, right? And so that's actually a really small, tiny signal. And what you have to now do is then amplify that signal so that, so that you can actually move woofers. Speakers are really moving air, right? Woofers and tweeters uh, is really uh, moving air. And so you take that little signal and you slowly process it and then you amplify it. Then it then you send it to additional amplifiers and you know to increase that signal strength and then you know, if you want something really loud, if you look at, you know, in some of these cars and some of these audio, uh, you know, uh, follower folks that are really into, you know, music systems, they have a car full of amplifiers. You open up and, you know, there's like, you know, many stages of amplifiers. Building a laser or increasing a laser power is exactly the same thing. You start with a very small signal and then you have amplifier stages increase the you know to increase the output the final output the difference is the amplifier stages are these other laser medium that you can uh, you know electrically pump optically pump to produce the gain that you need you know so in car stereo your amplifiers are driven by you know electricity right and so um in Laser systems, they can be driven electrically, but they can also be driven optically as well. Um, so they can be pumped by other lasers, or they can be pumped with flash lamps, or they can be pumped with laser diodes, or other or other forms of light. Uh, and then they can also be electrically pumped as well. Yeah. Are there things that you see in the future that you're like, we can't figure out how to get there right now, but there is a possibility of doing that? Is there technology that you are looking at every day or have been contemplating for the last three decades and saying, it could do something like that if we could just figure out how to do it. But that potential is there. Do you have anything like that? In lasers? Um, I don't know about in lasers. You know, uh, I, I guess part of it's because uh, it's, amazing to me to see you know where lasers have gone and and have come from and where it's at now and i think the potential is is you know for improved laser systems is pretty readily attainable um 
like one of the big things in in the laser industry right now is is laser fusion power plants, right? So the lab recently uh, demonstrated you know laser fusion for the you know, first time ever by you know, a huge huge uh, deal uh, within the scientific you know community. Um, you know, so this is like Nobel Prize winning type of achievement. And it's taken the lab many many decades. Uh, you know, just the enormous amount of just, you know, incredible minds to make this happen. Uh, and really the next, one of the next steps in this laser diffusion was how do you take what the lab's done and move it towards being able to make a power plant for generating electricity, you know, for, you know, everyday households and for, 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 you know, uh, you know, individual consumptions, uh, uh, and that laser system is very, very different than the laser system that, you know, the lab used to, to, to demonstrate this fusion. You know, the laser the lab used to demonstrate fusion, uh, you know, is a, a research tool that requires, you know, um, once every day or once, you know, several hours where a laser for uh, a power plant, a fusion for power plant generation, needs to fire like 10 times a second, right? And so, but um, but even thinking about, you know, the difference in those two systems, you know, that, you know, I easily see the technology or the laser technology that gets us to there. Um, the thing that that is not laser that I always, you know, that I always kind of think about is, is really space travel. Space travel is, you know, is, is uh is a fun, you know, um, technology to kind of think about, you know, Elon Musk and NASA, you know, talking about going to Mars, right? But, you know, when we talk about other potential planets like Earth, they're light years away, right? And then growing up watching Star Trek, you know, yeah. and the shows of nowadays, you know, there's these warp drives or these wormholes, right, that can – that is a gateway between, you know, a shortcut between, you know, um, galaxies. And I think that's the stuff I think is, is really cool. Fascinating. You know, that, yeah. You know, cause you know, nothing that we make, you know, approaches anything near the speed of light. Right. And so right. If we're talking about think, you know, we're talking about, you know, planets being hundreds of light years away. How are we going to get there? And, and if you think about, you know, get, getting back to, you know, kind of like, you know, alien life, right? I mean, if there was alien life that came to Earth, that means somehow they've harnessed this knowledge of traveling what we deem as light years, right? Um, and so those, I think that that sort of area is, is more perplexing and uh, to me than I think you know, what you know, what's possible with lasers. Um, you know, I think every day we find new applications and new places to use lasers and then we morph our lasers for that uh, but yeah but I, I i don't think we're kind of done with um with yeah you know, areas where lasers can be used yet i don't even think we're close uh, now talk about the use of a, a laser when we talk about laser guided i can't wrap my mind around what that means it's like is the laser shooting out? Because it's only like a straight line, right? And yeah, for the most part, straight line. Yes, line of it, sight. Is it actually guiding a missile to go somewhere, or does it put a point down, and the missile finds that point because the laser is just pointing at the point? Yeah, it, it's more like that. So, so guided missiles are basically you have to have some sort. The laser is used as more of a beacon. It's, yeah. Is the mm -hmm. way to think about it. So it's the illumination that generates a signal that then the missile's looking for. Yeah. Does that yeah. help? Yeah, but is it a point on the ground? Yes. Or is it so there's a point where it's like if you're ten thousand feet up, there's a point that's like pointed at that target, and then yeah. it's in the machine of the missile, it follows it. Yes. And some of that's actually a point that's generated by, you know, the device itself. And some of it's actually a person on the ground with a 
laser that's pointing to that place. So there's, you know, um, yeah, so there's both actually. Um, so a lot of these um, guided bombs and stuff that you see, you know, used by, you know, our warfighters coming off of jets for the bombers and our stuff, uh, have the laser guidance on, on, on the, you know, on the plane itself. So on that plane somewhere, um, is a separate laser that, you know, is pointing, it's ranging almost, uh, targeting, you know, where it wants that, you know, bomb drop. Yeah. You know. How much further out, I think we, we talked about it earlier, but how much further out does lasers have to go? I mean, short of like we becoming these sort of like microscopic things that hop on a laser and we travel with the speed of light. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> how much further is it in real life application uh, for you? Um, I, you know, I can imagine you go, okay, there's a target way over there. We're just trying to get it and we just need to get smaller chips we have to get better technology i mean where is the the sort of the goalposts for people like you ah uh, good question um you know we so um my group here uh, we don't build a lot of laser systems here and so we're you know um the group that i'm working in now kind of work on the components that make lasers um uh, and so i haven't I, I guess I shouldn't say that. And so, um, so we do more optics for lasers, for laser applications. So, for instance, um, you know, one of the components that we uh, developed that enables um, a laser technology uh, is this, this diffractive, a wave dispersive optic. And so, um, you know, a lot of folks that get laser eye surgery, for instance, right? Um, there's a new class of lasers that do laser eye surgery that is super high precision and produces what the you know very little collateral damage because it it imparts very little amount of heat. So you know when you typically see a laser do machine or something, you know you see sparks flying and stuff, and that's because those type of lasers impart a lot of heat into uh into the workpiece but there's a class of laser systems that are used for machining but also for science um that is what they call um a cold you know cold laser or or you know non-heat generated type of laser systems and and we actually uh you know, make and fabricate and advance uh, optical components out that enables this type of laser. And what this laser is, is it, they're, good, they're a class of lasers that's called ultra-fast lasers. And so it's uh, a laser with all, you know, very, very short durations. And so you can have a laser that is continuous, kind of like our light is continuous, where you can have lasers with very short bursts Bursts of energy, and then that burst can range anywhere from you know fractions of a second to you know to trillionths of a second sort of numbers. Super super short durations. Okay, um, and so these lasers that have very short, ultra ultra short durations um, are a class of lasers that are called ultra fast or chirp pulse amplification lasers. And that requires a very special optical technologies to enable these lasers. And so we make like those optical components. Um, the laser weapon systems that you're starting to see a lot of, um, in the news is made by an optical components that, you know, so there's predominant uh, technology behind these laser weapon systems that you're starting to see out um, in the news is is uh, uses a technology that combines a lot of lasers into one beam. And so we found, you know, so scaling lasers, one of your questions, scaling laser output powers. Scaling laser output powers is, uh, and being able to maintain certain optical characteristics like good beam quality. 
it's like when you take that magnifying glass, right? And you have to get it at the exact right distance so you can yeah. get the beam small enough to burn, right? That is uh, a function of what we call beam quality. So, so to get really good output power and really good beam quality is, is actually pretty hard to achieve. Um, and building a single laser to do that has been, you know, something that's been very difficult uh, uh, for us to 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 realize. Uh, and that's because when you're making something bigger, more powerful, you're requiring more electricity, more, you know, uh, which means more heat. Um, and when you heat something, you actually distort it. And when you distort something, all kinds of bad things happen. You, you can overheat it and cause damage. You can cause it to degrade in that nice spot. Is it no longer sm nice and small anymore? So it becomes not a very effective. And, so, and also bigger systems, you know, that require more pumping and more electricity are not necessarily the most reliable systems because you're, you know, you're overdriving those systems. So, what we found is that if you have a bunch of smaller systems that are much more electrically efficient, they're a lot more robust. And so if you can combine a bunch of these together into a single beam, uh, you know, that technology would be easier to realize and more cost effective than trying to build something big. And so the new, so one of the main technologies for these laser weapon systems is a technology called spectral beam combining where you're taking a lot of these number of little lasers and putting them together to make one big laser. And the main component that allows for that combination to occur. Okay. I got okay. Let me ask the question. Um, so what, what's your day to day look like? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, so, you know, I'm super lucky and fortunate the fact that um, I work in this program called NIF, National Admission Facility, that you know specializes really in, in laser technology. And uh, I've been afforded kind of the opportunity to have uh, a very small group that specializes in you know a very specific type of laser technology and. And we're really kind of the only group of our kind in the world that does all the different things that we do with lasers. And, and because of that, you know, we uh, get to kind of pick um, the things that we want to work on and what we work on around, you know, around this kind of technology area. Um, so our group is uh, mostly actually funded from outside of the lab. Uh, and so we are involved in um, certain lab activities within our program, uh, but very small. Most of our work is actually for uh, university or institutions like the lab, other, other laboratories here within the United States, uh, and also in Europe. Uh, and we do a lot of work for some private industries, uh, defense contractors, and a lot of uh, DOD work, defense-related work. Um, and so right now, I think we have something like 14 or 16 projects. So we're only a team of, uh, of uh, six. So the group that I work in is, is really, really small. Um, but I think we have something like 14 to 16 projects right now. And some of it is um, scientific, where we're doing, you know, developing and advancing uh, these fundamental optical technologies, uh, you know, for advancing laser technology as a whole. And then we have projects where we are looking at the next generation concepts of, of laser configurations for the military and then we're also providing and developing optical subcomponents for either you know the military DOD or the scientific community um, so 
my day to day is kind of crazy. Um, so it starts, you know, while I'm sleeping, typically <laughs> things pop up in my mind of, of what needs to be done. Uh, but I'm mostly, I'm very, very hands on. Um, so, uh, I work and live in the lab. So on the other side of this wall that you're looking at, so my, my office is actually where I also do laser work. And so I call it my little skunk work area where I, you know, play with, um, laser technologies or think about laser technologies, but that's where my office is too. Um, so my day basically starts with, um, thinking about what the group needs to do that day. Uh, when you have, you know, this many projects, you know, there's that many deliverables as well. Uh, so one of the things that's unique about our group is that most of the projects that we get funded for, uh, is it has two folds, but in the end, what really matters is that our customer is getting some sort of widget. We get seldomly ever funded just for basic science, you know, where we can just kind of do basic science, write papers and publications. Typically, we, in the end, are delivering some sort of hardware to our, our sponsors. Uh, and so what that means is that in our group, we have to balance. There's a balance between trying to do too much and trying, you know, doing too much, you know, in terms of advancements, too much unknown, right? Because part of our charter here at the lab is to push the forefront of science, do something that industry isn't doing or someone else isn't doing, how do, do you, something different. How do you come up with that? How do you, how do you <laughs> say, okay, we're a team of six and we're going to come together and do things that are not out there. It's like you're creating something from nothing, but like, where's the directive? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's like, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm an extremely practical person and uh, I'm an executor. What, what I find is most of the technology, even though we see it or you see it or laser folks see it as novel, it's not necessarily novel. It, it exists somewhere already, right? And, and maybe I borrow something from, you know, electronics or I borrow something from the biology discipline and I bring it into lasers and that, and, and that, so it's not novel in some other field, but it's novel in the laser optics field. Um, or we take, or we take technologies from all these different fields and we merge it, right? Um, and so for me, like I mentioned, I've never been much of a visionary in terms of seeing things intrinsically from, you know, from scratch, right? I, I'm very sort of application driven, which, you know, which I, I kind of deem as problem solving. So someone comes to me and says, you know, we have this problem, you know, you know, what can we do to fix this problem or what can we develop to fix this problem? And that's where I'm the best at uh, is, is, you know, and so one of the things like when I was younger, when I first, and, and this is, you know, advice from a really amazing mentor of mine. And he says, you know, you want to try to broaden, you know, be as broad as you possibly can technologically just don't just focus on lasers and optics you know understand what you know state of the art is you know for electronic state of the art is for chemistry state of the art is for computing you know and and that you know is where it's you know where you'll you potentially be you know the most helpful and useful and so i've always been pretty good about dabbling and reading and trying to stay on top of you know other disciplines and that has, you know, I think helped me Help, yeah. be able to solve some of these problems and come up with some of these solutions and some of these technologies that, you know, uh, that people are after. Um, but yeah, so I've never been a, a person where you develop something and then the application comes, comes afterwards, right? Yeah. Where you, you, know, you do something neat and cool, but, but there's really not a use for it. And then at some point, some later, date someone says oh yeah i can use that to use it i'm more the other way around where you know where there's a bottleneck or you know there is some sort of hurdle uh technological hurdle that can't be overcome and that and i you know go in and, and try to figure out how to you know 
to fix that. How many laser houses are there in the world or in the, let's start with the United oh. States. Um, you know, at your level, I'm sure it's a, it's a, it's a probably at the high level because there's only, you know, that kind of money in the government funding this, but you know, typically we're talking and it, you know, my question is going to reflect back to Vietnam and, you know, like, are, is that, the world of Vietnam ever going to see, or are they seeing any of this technology that that's being developed right now? You know, so. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it, we had there, this, yeah. Yeah. We had this project for Nike many, many years ago. This was probably two decades ago and Nike at the time, you know, and, and still is right. The shoe companies are, they have to innovate shoes. They pump out new designs and, uh, you know, different souls, different, you know, art and stuff like every, you know, every few months or something crazy like that. But it takes a long time, I guess, to tool up a factory and change the tooling to make a given shoe. And so we had developed this uh, technology for laser machining. Uh, this is a couple of decades ago. Nowadays, it's everywhere. But back then, it wasn't everywhere. Nike came to us and wanted uh, to talk about making a laser tool that could basically bridge the gap when they thought of something, they could prototype it and potentially make it, be, you know, and then at some point, their tools would catch up and, you know, get into high production. Um, but, you know, that was in Vietnam. Those tools were meant, you know, and the production at that time was for, Wow. Teams, you know, at the Nike factory, uh, you know, in Vietnam. I, I think that's probably in Hanoi, right? Somewhere around Hanoi, I think there's that. Um, but, you know, uh, right now, I think, you know, if you look at proliferation of lasers, it's like proliferations of TVs or computers. It's it's done over in, in China. I mean, some of the most powerful manufacturing lasers, machine lasers, and systems, and the lowest cost systems, highest volumes are, are made made in China. Uh, I saw a video on YouTube not too long ago uh, where uh, a company, a uh, Chinese company, was marketing uh, a new cutting laser, and they're cutting to eight inches of steel with a laser, eight inches of steel. Um, and done in basically second, second, I mean, and, you know, this is a machine that you can buy, you know, now today. Um, so yeah, it's just, yeah. Um, so have you, you know, access to these tools, uh, you know, is, 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 you know, readily today. Yeah. yeah. Have you been to Vietnam? I no, should... not yet. And what what do you think? Uh, what do you think you'll come up? Uh, what do you think will come up uh, when you get there? I don't know. You know, I I think you and I talked about this uh, briefly, and you know, I never had a huge desire to go to Vietnam until more recent. You know, I I shouldn't say it. as I've gotten older and, um, and more mature, it, it's been something on my mind and on my bucket list. But you know, younger growing up. It wasn't so, and part of it is because, you know, my dad, you know, was in the military and, and had very adverse feelings towards the communist government, right? And what happened with the war and what happens, you know, after the war with his family, you know, with his dad being thrown in prison and, and other folks that, you know, that he was really close to, but, you know, that was... Uh, badly treated by the communist uh, government. And so I, I've always seen, you know, Vietnam being a communist country growing up as, you know, this, you know, very adversary, you know, uh, entity. And it, so it wasn't, and since we really didn't have family there, I, I didn't have a connection to Vietnam except for this very negative feeling about the country, right? Um, and it hasn't until I've gotten older and more mature and, you know, and realized that, you know, that we, you know, things have changed a lot and, and what the government is, is not what the people necessarily are. Right. 
um, and just you know, and and mainly you know people that are in southern Vietnam are still the same southern you know Vietnamese that you know my dad were right that uh, uh, where he grew up and where we were, and that folks from you know the communist north are are not necessarily you know the government folks or individuals like us. And as we travel more, you know, I think, you know, you, it's hard not to realize that, you know, we, everybody's pretty much the same. Yeah. Right? And, yeah. and I want to go back to that word, that thing you were just talking about. The government is not the same as the people and the people are not the government. And the, but I'll break it down even one more level too, is the government is not even the government of the people in government, which means that, there are a lot of dissenting voices within the government. There's a lot yeah. of forces that want to progress the will of the right. modern world that right. is happening in the government. And it's like, it's not a clean uh, model. No. In the world. And, yeah. and especially in Vietnam, it's not, yeah. it's not one party, what we think, oh, they're, they're trying to do it this. It's right. a lot of moving parts. Yeah. So I think, you know, the, so we grew up, you know, with you know, with around my dad's friends and him, you know, talking war talks and things, you know, as as um, you know, you know, one of the things my dad got together with his friends quite a lot, and you know, we were expected basically to kind of sit there while he hung out with his friends, and so, but they gave us the opportunity to listen, right? Yeah, and but it also made us very jaded, right? Because they they had a lot of anger. You know, and uh, towards a communist government, right? Um, but as I've gotten older, you know, and traveled, as I mentioned, you know, I now, you know, my belief is is that ninety nine point nine percent of the folks in this world are good people. You know, very very good people, and it's the small fraction, you know, extremely small fraction of folks that you know. Um, that can have tremendous negative effects on the rest of us, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, and it's a small fraction that unfortunately is very impactful, right? Even though it's a, it's a small number, their, um, you know, their decisions um, can be extremely impactful and sometimes, you know, way overwhelms the 99.9% .9 of the good that, yeah. you know, that's around and, and, uh, and so I think I try to keep that in perspective um, and, you know, having, you know, kind of this new, more progressive thinking, it, you know, has made me want to better um, kind of connect to, you know, uh, to Vietnam. You know? and, and it's kind of different for me, too. I, I think, you know, I've talked about this, you know, we grew up in a southern central Oregon town where we were, you know, I think at first the only, you know, the only Vietnamese family there, right? And so I have always kind of seen myself, you know, ethnically um, as Vietnamese. But culturally, I'm as American as they come, you know? I, you know, and so I, I don't know if that makes sense or not. And so I, you know, I grew up around a lot of other Vietnamese families or yeah, culture, that makes sense. you know? You know, and so I grew up around, you know, uh, you know, a blue collar, you know, southern central Oregon, you know, um, um, area. And that's, you know, that's where, you know, that, that's that's what I resonate with. And that's, you know, yeah. that's and that's the foundation of who I am is this, you know, this upbringing in this town. And it's not, you know, this Vietnamese culture. Right? But did you ever have sort of identity crisis issues growing up or even now? Like, uh, um yeah, what do you mean by that? I guess, uh, what do you mean by identity crisis? Like, you never look in the mirror and go, well, because I have this. I'm only speaking from experience. It, it's only related because of my mind uh, when I have this issue of like one foot in, one foot out. I I don't know sometimes why, well, you know, as I'm doing this journey, it's, it's you know, I'm learning more. But I, I didn't know, like those years I was in the Marine Corps, that I was Vietnamese. Obviously, I knew ethnically <laughs> I came from of the Vietnamese people, but I really could not 
figure out in my early years who I wanted to be. And I guess that's the question. Like, mm. but you're fully formed now, you know, you're, you're. Yeah. I, I guess I don't worry about who I'm going to be more than I think when I think about when you mentioned identity crisis, when I was asking about, you know, about you kind of elaborating at is that is I, I guess I've always had a feeling of whether I was in the right place, not knowing where I'm supposed to be. I know who I am, but I never felt like, you know, like when my parents used to travel down to San Jose to visit their friends and we would go like to the Lion Plaza or somewhere, right. Or to out to, to a restaurant, which we never did very often, but you know, somewhere where it's all Vietnamese folks. I felt like, everybody was staring at me. Hmm. Right. And like, I was the odd man out, but, but at the same time, it, it happens to me when I am in Klamath Falls. Like I was just back in Klamath Falls this last weekend. Um, my wife's family is still all there and we go back there and visit. And when I go into restaurants there and, and it's predominantly white, I feel like they're all staring at me there too, you know, or we go into the store. And so, I'm, you know, so, and I think that's one of the reasons why I love being in California and I love being in the Bay Area. Um, you know, like when I was working down in Silicon Valley, you know, one of the best things was going in into the cafeteria during lunchtime. You know, you smelled all kinds of different ethnic food. There wasn't, you know, a predominant smell and there wasn't a predominant, you know, ethnic group, right? I mean, you had Asian, you know, you had. Southern Pacific Asians, you have Southern Eastern Asians, you know, you, you have, you know, Americans and you have Europeans, you know, you had Hispanic, you know, Southern South. It is awesome. I think that's one of the awesome things about being in California and being in this area is I actually don't have, I don't think about not belonging. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's been awesome to raise my kids here because I think, you know, for them, you know, everything is shades of brown, right? There is no, you know, person that's white or a person that is black or a person that is brown. To, to them, it's, it's, I don't even think it's something they think about, no. you know, and I think that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I, it's just, you know, I think I'll always have this, you know, this issue of whether or not I fit in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just because I—that's how I grew up. Uh, I think not being not being in a Vietnamese community, and being Vietnamese, and not and being in a white community, but not being white, right? <laughs> so yeah, I, I I wonder like a hundred years from now, our descendants are listening to this, and they're just like, God, that's trippy. They actually thought that they right. were a part of a cultural group of people. They had their weird tribes. And right. they, <laughs> the tribes and they go to war with each other. And then it's like, you know, maybe a hundred, 200 years from now, everybody is sort of like the same because of how much mixing is going on. And, you know, yeah. we're going to be like these, uh, like Navajo tribes or, you know, when they look back, yeah. at, you know, um, Comanches and, you know, these are tribes that existed hundreds of years ago in America, but now it's like everybody in America is one ethnic group. Yeah, but you know, I I do hope that you know, even though you know, we start to blend in that way, we still are able to preserve our individual cultures because I think that's important too. You know, because I think we can learn from different, you know, and from different cultures and different traditions, and um, so I hope there is this blending in a sense, but yet, you know, being able to still preserve, you know, some of our cultural identities. And so why? That, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much for today. It, uh, you know, we, we talked about uh, the science of this all and we <laughs> got into this, you know, the end of, uh, of our conversation, the cultural side of, of things. And uh, I look forward to um, seeing you this weekend and uh, hanging out with you and, and talking and picking up more of the uh, conversation. I do too. I appreciate the conversation, Ken. It always helps me to kind of reflect and think about these things and think about how fortunate we are. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, I look forward to seeing you guys here tomorrow. Yeah. Yep. And uh, hanging out and getting some good grub. 
All right. Thank you, Anhuang. All right. Take care, Ken. Thank you for listening to The Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. Special thanks to Brittany Tran, to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. <laughs>